Okay, and thank you for joining us today for Harvard Library Presents Archival Stories of Indigenous and Asian Experiences at Harvard. My name is Emily Van Dyke, I'm Siksika, and I'm Harvard College Class of 2003 and Harvard Chan School of Public Health Class of 2009. As, as of last weekend, I've served as Native American alumni of Harvard University president for exactly five years. We've hit some rewarding and hard won milestones in the 14 plus years that NAHU, uh, as Native American alumni of Harvard University is known, has been an HAA recognized state, none of which would have been possible with, without the path breaking contributions of the students and alumni who came before us. I am honored to share this virtual space with you from the unceded land of the Duwamish people of Seattle, past, present, and emerging, honoring with gratitude and admiration the profound resilience of the land and the Duwamish tribe, which continues on a four decades long journey to gain federal recognition. And because our shared bonds to Harvard bring us together today, we honor the original stewards of the land on which Harvard sits. Harvard University is situated on the traditional lands of the Massachusetts people. The Harvard Charter of 1650 committed our institution to the, in, the education of English and Indian youth of this country. As a chartered creation of the Massachusetts colonies and the Commonwealth, Harvard evolved alongside the original stewards of the state of Massachusetts, the Massachusetts the Wampanoag tribe of Gay-Hadaquina, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, and the Nipmuc Nation, who are still living, working, and building community on small portions of their traditional homelands. Our acknowledgement serves as a first step away from the erasure of these profound histories of survival, perseverance, and innovation. I've been asked to provide a brief context to this, the fourth, the fourth Unity webinar, and to the forthcoming Unity Weekend, which will be our a first ever for Harvard. Hosted in partnership with the Harvard Latino Alumni Alliance, Harvard Black Alumni Society, Harvard Asian American Alumni Alliance, Native American Alumni of Harvard University, and HAA. This, this virtual conference on the last weekend of September 2021 will provide a forum for diverse communities to come together for candid conversations on complex issues at the intersection of identity, inclusion, and impact. The first stirrings of Unity Weekend began about five years ago, and then as Amaki supporting holistic race conscious Harvard admissions, our SIGs saw as never before, the power and urgency of collaborating. Our SIG leaders have met together multiple times, including at the alumni leadership conferences of 2019 and 2020. After more than two years of conference planning, which turned into an extended timeline due to necessary COVID induced delays, we are eagerly anticipating the chance to present Unity Week in this fall. Events will be hosted jointly as well as individually by the, the sponsoring groups and will occur in conjunction with Harvard's first ever Latinx alumni reunion, H4A's fourth global summit and NAHU's seventh alumni symposium. Some very brief housekeeping details. If you need tech support or if you have a question, please chat HAA support. If you have questions for our presenters during the program, please chat Q&A submission and we will call on you as time allows during the Q&A. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Martha Whitehead. Martha is vice president for the Harvard Library as well as university librarian and Roy E. Larson librarian for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Martha leads a network made up of more than 25 separate libraries and employing more than 700 staff. Martha's career has been dedicated to research libraries and their user communities. She has served on many national and international boards and is currently vice chair and chair elect of the Ivy Plus Libraries Consortium, a group that facilitates collaboration across this storied group of research universities. She has a particular interest in ensuring equitable access to information and currently serves on the Association of Research Libraries Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. Martha joined Harvard University in June 2019 from Queen's University in Canada, where she served as Vice Provost for Digital Planning and University Librarian. Welcome and thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today, Martha. Thank you very much, Emily. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here and to welcome all of you to this event. One of my favorite things is really to think about our, our archives and the stories that they tell. So I'm really pleased to be able to share that with you today. 
the stories from individuals in the Harvard community across time really provide us with the chance to understand what campus was like and how it has evolved. And we find echoes of current sentiments and challenges, but also indications of real change in how far we've come in providing a place that welcomes all. Uh, the stories within our archival materials ultimately underscore the importance of what seem like simple principles that are really critical for treating, for creating um, lasting connections with one another across time and also in this current time. And those are the principles of diversity, inclusion and belonging and anti-racism. At Harvard Library, we like to say that we aspire to be global leaders in expanding world knowledge and intellectual exploration. And that starts on our campus as we support faculty and students in pursuing anti-racism through their research, teaching and learning. And it also extends well beyond our campus as we engage with people around the world in ensuring that a diversity of voices are heard in our collections and in the information that's shared by every local community and culture in all parts of the globe. And of course, we don't do this alone through our partnerships on campus and collaborative networks around the world, we really aim to support equitable access to a diversity of content, easy engagement with trustworthy information, and thoughtful preservation for the future. So this focus builds on our core values, which emphasize that we lead with curiosity, we seek collaboration, we champion access, we aim for the extraordinary and we embrace diverse perspectives to construct a more inclusive and just world. So it's my pleasure in this welcome to introduce you to our speakers. Um, we have several Harvard Library experts who will be sharing material with us today that illuminate stories throughout Harvard's past of how Indigenous and Asian students navigated the campus community and how these experiences shaped their futures. So we'll have Ross Mulcair. Ross is the archivist for outreach, research, instruction, and special, special projects at the Harvard University Archives, where he connects students, researchers, alumni, and administrators to Harvard's long history. He is an alumnus of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, having received his PhD in history in 2016. We'll have Annie Wang, who is the cultural assistant for the spe for special collections at the Harvard Yanjing Library, where she oversees its abundant special collections repository and manages its rare book reading room. She supports students, faculty, researchers, and other visitors in all of their rare material needs and is deeply interested in the digitization efforts to increase access for all. And Annie has been at the Harvard Yanjing Library since 2008. And then we will have Kuniko Yamada McVeigh. Kuniko is the librarian for the Japanese collection of the Harvard Yenjing Library, where she builds the collection and provides research support for students and scholars on Japan. And this is work that she's been doing for over two decades. She is an alum of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, having received her MA in, in Regional Studies uh, East Asia in 2013. So starting off with Ross, he will introduce us to William Jones, class of 1900, a Meskwiki or Fox man who made his way in the late 19th century from the Sac and Fox Agency in Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, to Harvard College. And Jones, as we'll learn, died quite young, but made a real impression on his classmates and left a distinctly Indigenous mark on Harvard. Annie's presentation is China Comes to Harvard, and it's a presentation centered on the Chinese Students Club founded in 1909, but its origins can be traced back to 1879 with the arrival of the first chair of Chinese instruction at Harvard and quite possibly of all American universities. Her presentation will draw from the archives of the Harvard Yanjing Library to introduce and briefly highlight the pioneering spirit and accomplishments of some of the first Chinese nationals to be educated at Harvard. And then Kuniko will present on Surumi Shinsuke, uh, who was born and raised in Tokyo in 1922, um, was sent to America in 1938 and enrolled in Harvard College in um, 1839, sorry, <laughs> 1939 at the age of 17, where he studied philosophy. After the Pacific War broke out in 1941, he was arrested by FBI 
and completed his honor thesis in the detention center while waiting for a deportation in 1942. Some 40 volumes of his personal books uh, brought from Japan are now stored in the Harvard Ganjing Library. So with that, I will now turn the program over to Ross Mulcair. Thanks, Martha, and thank you to Emily for the introductory remarks as well. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ross, as Martha, Martha mentioned. I'm the archivist for outreach, research, instruction, and special projects at the Harvard University Archives. In just a moment, I'm gonna share with you some information about William Jones, a Harvard College alumnus from the class of 1900. Jones is a really interesting figure who is at Harvard at this turn of the century moment where there are seemingly endless compelling characters and stories. If you were at the Unity event last November, you'll recognize the year 1900 as the moment when the thousand plus Cuban teachers came to Harvard for the summer, as well as just a bit before the librarian Plinono Gebewolo, who we also learned about, attended Harvard. As we think about the native history of Harvard, we have a tendency to go to the fairly well-documented 17th century with the Charter of 1650 that Emily referred to and its commitment to the education of English and Indian youth, the Indian College, Caleb Chishateamuk, and so on. These are really important parts of Harvard's past and the history of this region and its peoples, but I did wanna offer up a story that's a bit less well-known and certainly one that took place at a Harvard that looks more like the one you and I attended. Before I begin, I wanna say a few words about words. One of the challenges of engaging with native history is that native is of course a broad designation that encompasses hundreds of unique polities and cultures. This is complicated even further by the fact that so many of our historical sources are from a European or Euro-American perspective where distinct native groups and histories are conflated, misunderstood, and misrepresented. There's also a language issue. For example, when referring to Jones, most of his white contemporaries referred to him simply as Indian. Occasionally, someone would refer to him as Fox. The Fox, of course, don't call themselves the Fox, they are the Meskwaki. We talk now about the Sac and Fox tribe. The Sac too have other names, other historical names, including the Sauk, and refer to themselves as the Othakiwaki. Where possible, I've tried to be specific about Jones's Meskwaki identity, but also wanna note that I'll be relaying some information from historical sources using the terms of the times, which often weren't quite as specific. I'm gonna share my screen now. For a bit of geographical and historical context, I wanna start us off here where Jones's story begins. Jones was born in 1871 in the Sac and Fox Agency in what was then still Indian territory. We would recognize this area now as Oklahoma, of course. And in fact, the Sac and Fox tribal headquarters is still right here in what is now Stroud, Oklahoma. Oklahoma was not admitted to the Union until 1907 though, and even the famous land run of 1889 with its boomers and Sooners was almost two decades later than Jones's birth. If we take a look at this historical map from 1884, you can get a sense of the political and cultural geography of Indian territory. This map is representative of how this region was organized when Jones was a boy. But if you look at the same region on maps throughout the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, you see all of these different borders shifting constantly. This is a really complex place and one that would be complicated further by the Dawes Act of 1887 and the land run of 1889 I mentioned, not to mention the creation of Oklahoma as a state. In the interest of time, I don't wanna to dwell too much on the details of Jones's childhood, but I do wanna mention a few key biographical facts that are particularly relevant to our discussion. Jones, as I mentioned, was born in 1871 and was representative of a particular type of native person who was becoming increasingly common in North America through the 18th and 19th centuries, especially. His great grandfather came to America from Wales, fought in the American Revolution with the Patriots and eventually had a son in Kentucky named William Washington Jones. William fought in the Black Hawk War in 1832, which was a conflict involving Black Hawk, of course, who was a Sauk leader, but also the Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi. He met and married a woman named Katikwa, who was the daughter of Washihowa, a Meskwaki Mis leader. In 1844, Katikwa gave birth to a son given the name Bald Eagle, also known as Henry Clay Jones. Henry was raised as a Meskwaki with Fox traditions and participating in Fox tribal government, but also found his way in the white settler society of Iowa. He became a blacksmith and eventually married an English woman named Sarah Penny. 
In 1871, Sarah gave birth to William, our subject today, and unfortunately died within a year of his birth. William Jones was taken in by his grandmother, Katiqua, and was given the name Megasiawa, or Black Eagle. For the nine remaining years of her life, Katiqua raised Jones among the Meskwaki, speaking primarily the Meskwaki language, a central Algonquian language related to the Cree, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Shawnee languages, among others. I'm going to skip about a decade of Jones's life here in the interest of time and jump us forward to 1889, when Jones was 18 and very, very far from home. From 1889 to 1892, Jones lived in Hampton Roads, Virginia, where he attended the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute. Now called Hampton University, the school was built following the Civil War with the mission to educate formerly enslaved people who had been emancipated in the 1860s. From 1878 to 1923, the Hampton Institute also had a program for native education that focused, like all of the so-called Indian schools at the time, primarily on assimilation and acculturation. This is a case where putting two pictures alongside each other says more than I could possibly say about this topic. These are students from the Hampton Institute in its early years. And this is part of a really tragic story that was repeated through the country and not one I'm gonna to spend too much time on right now. One of the important things to remember about these efforts of forced assimilation and acculturation, and Jones fits into this, is that culture and identity operate in ways more complex than those during this period thought. This meant that in reality, even those that passed through these schools and ostensibly took on the characteristics of the dominant white society around them maintained aspects of native identity, often forming a kind of hybrid or syncretic identity or culture, which we're gonna see with Jones as we move forward. After three years at Hampton, Jones enrolled at Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. And remember at this point, Jones is 21, so he's significantly older than his peers at both Andover and later at Harvard. Jones's time at Andover is fairly unremarkable. He's a good student and one that makes enough of an impression on his instructors that they recommend he make his way down to Harvard College to continue his education. And what I wanna do now is just um, talk informally about a few items that are in Jones's student folder that we have at the Harvard University Archive, which is really revealing and really interesting. And I'm going to move pretty quickly through these. What you're seeing here is a form that was pretty standard that a secretary would be gathering for people who were applying for admission at Harvard to basically get a character reference or um, sometimes a character reference, sometimes um, a scholarly reference for students looking to be admitted. This is one, as you can see, for William Jones from a professor, um, an instructor at Andover named Charles Forbes. And I wanna note two things about this quickly. One is that you see presumably Cobb or a secretary of Cobbs has written at the top on the left in the front, an Indian needs aid. This is, these items are very common in the archives for all kinds of students. That note is certainly something that's not very common. I hadn't seen that before and it's, Interesting to note that they're identifying him by his um, nativeness is sort of the, the front thing, even there in red pin. And on the inside on the handwritten note from Forbes, you can see the bit about him, um, his, his father being a full-blooded Indian, which turns out isn't true, but this is how this kind of information gets uh, moved around at the time. So again, commenting on um, Jones's native background is really important here as he's applying to Harvard. This is uh, two parts of a form for Price Greenleaf aid. And the Price Greenleaf scholarship was a really important source of funding for students who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to come to Harvard. So another uh, really notable alumnus who benefited from Price Greenleaf aid who otherwise would not have been able to come to Harvard was W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, in this case, this is Jones applying for uh, Price Greenleaf aid. And I wanna zoom in on the right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Zoom in on the right and take a look. This is his Phillips um, Academy at Andover, his grades. But under this, his plan of study at Harvard College, where it's noted that he wants to take up medicine or Indian language work. And again, seeing Indian language work listed here as um, a course of study at Harvard is not something super common at the time. So this really stands out. And in fact, this is what he does pursue and becomes um, quite notable in the field. This document here is from his Price Greenleaf application. This is a letter of recommendation from um, Cecil Bancroft, who is the principal of Andover. And he gives this six pointed bullet pointed list of 
why Harvard should admit um, Jones to, to Harvard and get the Price Greenleaf aid. And I want to zoom in on this bit here, which is really interesting. This says, there is a picturesque element in his situation, which may properly be cited as an additional element of estimate in his behalf. There are not many men classed as Indians offering for the higher education. While he is not a pure Indian, he identifies himself with that stock. He was for four years at Hampton and has been four years here. He has been tried. There are many ways you could read and interpret this passage from Bancroft's recommendation letter. But what I think is interesting about this and the other material in Jones's student files is that all of the people working with him felt compelled to mention his native background. Bancroft's note here is particularly interesting because he seems to be suggesting to Harvard that there's an opportunity for Harvard to offer higher education to a native student and that that's inherently a positive thing. Again, I think you could really dig into this and think about what Bancroft is arguing here and how it might relate to that civilizing mission of the so-called Indian schools we mentioned earlier. But on a surface level, it's just really interesting to see how Jones's native identity is deployed by others during this process of applying to Harvard. Jones, as I'm sure you can figure out, was indeed admitted to Harvard and arrived in Cambridge in 1896. His admission to Harvard garnered some attention back home, as you can see from this issue of the Indian Chieftain, a newspaper from Venita, a small town in Indian territory. And as a personal side note, Venita, Oklahoma is actually where my family is from. So this was kind of a fun thing to come across. You'll notice a few odd things about this article as you look at it. Titled Blanket Indian to Enter Harvard, the article describes Jones as Shawnee, which he wasn't. And the title and some of the copy, especially the phrases blanket Indian and blanket tribe, not phrases we use now, are clearly meant to evoke an image of a young man arriving at an utterly foreign Harvard in traditional dress, which certainly wasn't the case with Jones. In fact, it wasn't even the case when he was arriving at Hampton. There's also a line here about Jones being, quote, the first Indian from any Western tribe to ever enter that institution of learning. I'm not really sure how they know that. And given the other issues with this short article, I'm not inclined to just believe them. But I also don't have any evidence to the contrary. So this is certainly something I'm interested in investigating a bit more. I want to um, briefly pause here and introduce an important character to this story, a friend of Jones named Henry Milner Rideout. Rideout was a year ahead of Jones at Harvard College, so the class of 1899, but they were close friends who worked closely together at the Harvard Monthly, the student-run literary magazine, which we'll come to in a bit. I want to mention Rideout explicitly here because it's his 1912 biography of Jones that not only documents the early history that we just went over, but also a sense of Jones's personality and especially some of some insights into his time at Harvard. Interestingly, I actually learned about Jones fairly recently when Shelley Lowe, the executive director of the Harvard University Native American program, forward me, forwarded me an inquiry about Jones from Dan Noyes, an alumnus from the class of 1972, who I see is here. So hi, Dan. Dan's aunt, Cecily Rideout McNeil, Henry Milner Rideout's daughter, is currently working with Brett Gustafson an anthropology professor at Washington University in St. Louis and a Harvard GSAS alumnus on a book about William Jones. And I mentioned this sort of complicated web of people, mainly so I can thank them for putting Jones on my radar and generously talking about him with me leading up to this event. I also mentioned this to show how much energy there is at this moment in really excavating Jones's past, which is exciting. So I think we're gonna be learning even more about him in the coming years. Rideout's biography of Jones is really interesting, especially in how he talks about Jones's native identity and the ways it came through and how he carried himself and how he related to other people. At various points throughout the book, Rideout mentions how if you didn't know Jones intimately, you'd have no idea about his native identity. It's not something that Jones projected or emphasized day to day. But you can see from the subtitle of Rideout's book here, Indian Cowboy, American Scholar and Anthropologist in the Field, that Rideout recognized indigeneity as a core part of Jones's life. One interesting anecdote from Rideout is about how Jones lived in Stoughton Hall for his entire four years, in Stoughton 26, in fact, and kept his room noticeably spare and almost cold feeling, which Rideout thought reflected the seriousness with which Jones approached his studies. Rideout writes, it was always a plain study, a man's room, and like its occupant, made no display of Indian belongings. Although to a friend at the right season of talk, 
Billy would produce from his lockers the most romantic objects, beadwork, weapons, a tobacco pouch fashioned from the head of a sorrel pony, all kinds of outdoor and wigwam things made by tribesmen with an eye for color. At other times, these keepsakes remain hidden. This little reflection by Rideout is representative of how he talks about Jones's native identity throughout the biography. It was something that Jones was clearly proud of, and he maintained a deep connection to his fox home back in Indian Territory. But it also seemed to be something he could and frequent and would frequently compartmentalize. He navigated Harvard with himself and his closest friends, knowing he was a native man and knowing what that meant to him. But to an outside observer, he didn't necessarily read as immediately different from any other Harvard student. One place where Jones's formative experiences in Indian Territory come through is in his writings in the Harvard Monthly, that student-run literary magazine I mentioned earlier. Jones, Jones published eight stories in the Harvard Monthly during his last two years at Harvard. And if you read them, and they're all at the Harvard University Archives, you realize he's telling stories quite different than those of his peers. Jones's stories were primarily about the American West, especially about cowboys and life in the West. Stories about cowboys are often, of course, frequently stories about Indians as well, and Jones threaded native characters through most of his short stories. Some of the titles of his stories might give you a sense of their contents. In 1880, 1899, he published a retelling of an old Sauk and Muskoki legend titled In the Name of His Ancestor. A year later, he published a story called The Heart of the Brave that took as its subject a war between the Sauk and the Comanche. These stories were informed by his own interest in Algonquian languages and storytelling and are quite unlike other things being published at the time at Harvard. While, the Harvard, while Harvard in the late 19th century is certainly an increasingly diverse place, the fact remains that most students hailed from the East Coast, especially New England and New York, and had experiences that informed their writing that looked very, very different than Jones's. And I wanted to include this photo here of, this is the um, class of 1900, photo of the editors of the Harvard Monthly. Jones is seated third from left here, sort of looking away from the camera. One of the most interesting things that Jones published in the Monthly, though, was a story titled Anoska Nimewina. It's a story focused on the so-called ghost dance movement of the 1890s, which we don't have time to go into right now. But in it, Jones writes about reservation life, about native psychology, and about the complexities of Native spiritual, cultural, and political movements. Embedded in the piece is the story of Shaskazi, an important figure in the storytelling tradition of various Algonquian speaking peoples, including the Sauk with whom Jones had done some anthropological fieldwork by this time. His own Meskwaki background apparently gave him access to a Sauk version of this story, and he published that version in the Harvard Monthly in 1899, including a footnote that said, as far as he knew, this was the first time this particular version of the story had ever been put in print. There's interesting questions here about whether a venue like the Harvard Monthly is an appropriate place for a story like this, and about even how Jones's anthropological fieldwork could be extractive and exploitative. But what I really appreciate about Jones writing and publishing this story is that it illustrates his commitment to indigenizing Harvard in his own way. As we learned from his friend Henry Milner Rideout, Jones was not someone who always led with his own native identity, often even hiding it completely when interacting with people. But when he found his home at Harvard, which for him was at the Harvard Monthly, he brought a unique perspective to the publication and used it to tell native stories in a way that hadn't been done before. And I'm running out of time, um, and I wanted to just focus on Jones's uh, time leading up to Harvard, navigating his way to Harvard, and navigating his time at Harvard. So I'm going to stop here and let Annie and Kuniko take over. Before I do that, I wanna briefly mention that Jones's story post Harvard has a really tragic arc. He goes on to Columbia after Harvard and studies with Franz Boas and becomes a linguistic anthropologist and a really important one at that. Then while doing field work in the Philippines in 1909, he's killed by some of the people he is there studying. So there's a whole interesting story after Harvard about Jones and the field of anthropology that I'd encourage people to read up on. Or, and certainly keep an eye out for work that's being done on him uh, going forward. So I will turn it over to Annie now to continue our programming. Thanks.
Thank you, Ross. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here today to briefly introduce the Yanqing Library's collection of Harvard Chinese Student Club and to highlight the achievements of some club members during the early 20th century and beyond. But before we go deeper, I'd like to set the stage by introducing the story of the first two Chinese nationals to arrive on Harvard's campus. I hope this contact will paint a richer picture of our main story today. Visitors to Yanqing Library are likely to have seen these photos on the left. This is Ko Kunhua in Chinese official garb, and the photo hangs prominently in our library. Harvard is a bit different from other universities. The first Chinese to come to campus was actually an instructor and not a student. During a time when trade in China was fruitful and lucrative, President Eliot and the corporation supported the creation of instructorship in Chinese. With the help of alumni contact in China's Imperial Maritime Customs Service, Ko was hired to teach Chinese for commercial purpose in 1879 trained to pass the Imperial Civil Service exam. Ko likely taught with his own classical poem to replicate his traditional training in an American classroom. The photo on the right is the book of his poem that, his, that he brought with him to Harvard. King was a freshman in the class of 1889 and was, um, and was Harvard's first Chinese student, graduating third in his class at Holyoke High School in Western Massachusetts. King came to US with a group of boys sent by the Qing Dynasty's imperial government as part of the Chinese educational mission. He completed only his freshman year here before being called back by the Qing government at the cancellation of the Chinese educational mission in 1881. The image on the right here is the Harvard Alumni Bulletin of 1920. Ting contributed $1,000 to, uh, to the Harvard Endowment Fund almost four decades after his freshman year. He wrote, I wish to record my loyalty to my alma mater and I feel that it is not only my duty, but also my privilege and pleasure to serve Harvard in this hour of her need. Due to various historical reasons, very few Chinese students came to Harvard until the beginning of the 20th century. The archive of Harvard Chinese Student Club at Yanqing Library gives us a window into its early 20th century's activities. The archive contains 36 folders of fully digitized materials with finding aids. For those interested, the URL on this slide will make you, will take you to the digital archive. At the beginning of the 20th century, a variety of programs started to provide comprehensive financial support to Chinese students wishing to study abroad. Foremost of those programs, the Baxter Indemnity Scholarship founded student to come in 1909. Found in the archive of the Chinese Student Club, this photograph shows the 47 students in the first group to receive the Indemnity Fund scholarships in 1909. Seven of them came to Harvard. Here are some examples of our archival materials. The many letters 
gave a peek into students' lives, such as some student, uh, some club members teaching English to the Chinese working class community in the Cambridge, Boston area around 1911. The next few slides showcase a few notable club members with some stories of their families too. The first name to appear on the club directory of 1917 was Zhang Fuyun, a graduate of Harvard College. He was the first Chinese national to graduate from Harvard Law School. Chang was one of 70 students who qualified for the Indemnity Scholarship in 1910. When he was in Tsinghua's preparation class for American college, his English teacher, a wealthy graduate, advised him to go to Yale. But his chemistry teacher, a Cornelian, said to him, if you want to be a football player, go to Yale. If you want to be a scholar, go to Harvard. Chang chose Harvard. At Harvard, Chang was a member of both the Chinese Student Club and the Cosmopolitan Club. He was a good friend of T.V. Soon, class of 1915. Later on, back in China, Soon became the finance minister of the nationalist government. He appointed Chang his Harvard friend director general of the National Customs Administration. Chang successfully oversaw the transition of control of the Chinese customs from a system run by foreigners to one with the Chinese officials in charge. His, his daughter, Julia Chang Block, received a master's degree in government and East Asian regional studies from Harvard in 1967. She was the first Chinese American to be appointed a U.S. ambassador serving in Nepal. 40 years after Harvard's first Chinese instructor, Gao Kunhua, Zhao Yuanren, was the second Chinese language teacher. Chao ranked second in the indemnity exam of 1910. He graduated from Cornell in mathematics and earned his PhD in philosophy at Harvard in 1918. Chao had his own methods for teaching Chinese, emphasizing speaking over writing. He developed a system of romanization of Chinese, which the Chinese government formally adopted in 1927. Chao's daughter, Rulai Chaobian, was one of the first female full professors in Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Those who lived at the Cabot House around 1975 might remember her. Rulan and her husband served as Harvard's first non-white housemasters in Cabot. The next gentleman is Li Ji. Li was a student of Professor Alfred Tozer, and I discovered Professor Tozer's name on the guest list for the, re for the reception at the Chinese Students Club. Li is known as the father of modern archaeology in China. His discovery at the Asian site of Inxu near Anyang were critical in proving the existence of the Shang dynasty. Li is the beginning of the Harvard legacy of a Chinese anthropologist. Having trained a formal chair of Harvard's Department of Anthropology, who himself has trained other Chinese alumni who are now professors in their fields at other American universities. 
Here is Niu Huizhu, one of the first Chinese graduate of Radcliffe, class of 1919, and also the vice president of Chinese Students Club. Miss Niu's father was one of the 120 boys in the Chinese educational mission who had come to the United States in early 1870s. Her brother, Niu Huisheng, a Harvard Medical School graduate, was also a club member at the same time with her. Miss Niu's host family organized her wedding ceremony in 1918 to an MIT Guoyang Mo. Their first son was born the next year and, wo and was voted the class baby by Radcliffe's class of 1919. Most of our materials of the Harvard Chinese Students Club was made possible by the first librarian of Yanqing Library, Alfred Kaming Chu, a Harvard PhD in 1933, worked at the library for 34 years. His scholarship and clear vision transformed the Yanqing into the world's most comprehensive academic library for East Asian studies. The history and the contribution of Chinese at Harvard are substantial. In addition to the early pioneering generation of Harvard affiliated Chinese, many others, such as I Am Pei and Yu Yu Ma, have also shaped both Harvard and China's history at the turn of the 21st century. But we're una unable to cover all of it in our brief time today. As well as materials on the figures I've introduced here, the Yanqing Library has rich resources documenting the countless Chinese alumni who have changed the world for the better. Against the odds, they showed America that China was a place of culture and refinement. Across a variety of fields, they have made outstanding contribution to human learning and the betterment of society. Last but not least is He Jiang, who received his PhD in molecular and cellular biology at Harvard. In 2016, 136 years after the first Chinese student came to Harvard campus, he walked the stage as the first Chinese graduate to speak at the university's commencement ceremony. My memory of his speech, from Ruzhu, China to Harvard and beyond, story in science is still fresh. And I think many in my generation growing up in China experienced the same as he did. Finally, before, please allow me to end my talk today with the word engraved on the Chinese dragon stele donated by the Chinese Alumni Association for Harvard Tercentenary Celebration in September 1936, which stands today between Widener and Boyston Hall. On this, the occasion of Tercentenary of the Founding of our alma mater we show our gratitude for the nurturing and inspiration we received here. Henceforth, we hope to witness the further enlargement and expansion of an ever increasing cultural interchange between our two countries, enabling the prosperity of the nation to follow the path of advanced learning. Of this ideal, we shall remain ever mindful. This concludes my presentation today. Thank you for listening.
Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Kumiko Yamada McVeigh, the librarian for the Chinese collection. Oh, sorry, the librarian for Japanese collection at the Yanqing Library. Sorry, I think you're muted. Oh, oh I am muted. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I hope you can see my screen, uh, first screen of uh, slideshow. Hello, uh, I'm Kuniko Yamada Makabei, and it is my pleasure to share a story of Shunsuke Tsurumi. Uh, he was a Japanese student at Harvard when Japan and the United States started the war in December 42, 41. Shunsuke was born in 1922 and raised in Tokyo, the son of prominent politician Tsurumi Yusuke and grandson of the influential statesman Goto Shunpei. Shunsuke is on the left of the family picture with his, his parents and three siblings. He looks already uh, quite rebellious. His father, uh, Yusuke, had been traveling US frequently while entering politics in 1928. He gave public lecture to counter anti-Japanese feelings there in 1920s, and then explained Japan's standing in 1930s. He was Japan's delegate to the Pacific Conference uh, several times since 1925. Uh, his sister, uh, Kazuko, uh, she was a sociologist with MA from Basa College in 1941 and a PhD from Princeton in 1967. Uh, she was one of uh, several uh, 14 female uh, PhD and uh, in Princeton prior to undergraduate co-education. So uh, she was the first uh, generation of PhD in Princeton. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and of course, uh, she was with Shunsuke in many critical points of his life and she had typed his honor thesis and delivered it on time while he was in prison. And she was also a founding member of the intellectual journal Shiso no Kagaku, which he, uh, Shunsuke started uh, right after the post-war. Uh, post uh, as a youth, uh, Shunsuke had been as a youth, Shunsuke was expelled from the three different schools and attempted suicide once, uh, more than once. As a last result, his father brought him to America to, uh, in 1933. Harvard professor Arthur Schrodinger Jr. was a friend of his father and helped Shunsuke settle in the US. At the initial meeting, he, uh, Professor Schrodinger introduced uh, Shigeto Tsuru, a Japanese graduate student at Harvard in economics. Shunsuke spent one year at the Middlesex School in Concord, Massachusetts, where he learned English intensively. Then next year, Shunsuke entered Harvard in 1939. Uh, 39. He was 17. Shunsuke became very close to uh, Shigeto Tsuru and thought advices from, from him during the Harvard years. Tsuru had transferred to Harvard in 1933 and BA in 1935, followed by PhD in 1940. His dissertation was uh, Development of Capitalism and business cycles in Japan, 1868 through 1897. Tsuru taught economics at Harvard till he and his wife were 
repatriated as enemy aliens and went back to Japan in the same boat with uh, Shunsuke in 1942. At Harvard, Shunsuke majored in philosophy and studying under William Van, uh, Willard Van Orman Quinn. Shinsuke was awarded honorary Harvard scholarship for marked excellence in his work in the past academic year with 113 students. Under the, 30, uh, under the uncertain circumstances, uh, uh, everyone was sensing some uh, uncertainty of war or international relationship. He considered speed up the at, uh, speed up the graduation in three years and started preparing his own thesis under Professor Perry, who was renowned uh, William James Scarab. He moved to the attic room on the Irving Street in 1941. Prior to that, he was living with uh, Mrs. Young's uh, residence. Uh, Mrs. Young was a has a son, uh, Charles, uh, he was a, a classmate of uh, Shunsuke. Uh, in 1940, Shunsuke, uh, Shunsuke, along with his sister Kazuko and friend Fumihiko Honjo, helped publishing in Japanese language textbook for the university students, authored by Harvard professors, Sergei Eiseyev and Edwin Leishauer. At that time, uh, Shinsuke was taking some uh, course, courses under Professor Leishauer, and you see this, uh, the black and white uh, photograph at the top corner right, uh, Professor Leishauer's seminar, which is, uh, which is taking place at the Harvard Yenchin Library's small bibliography room. Now, uh, Shinsuke brought with him to, uh, brought with him to America a small personal library. Uh, these are the uh, selection. Uh, we, uh, Yenchin Library have about 40 volumes of uh, books once be belongs to Shunsuke, and this is part of them. And he loved Russian literature in particular. He read Nietzsche and Kierkegaard with enthusiasm, and Shunsuke's excitement is apparent in the energetic lead and blue pencil markings that fills these books. His books, which were seized by, by the FBI, eventually found their way into the Harvard Yenchin Library. The accession stamp dates their arrival as June 30th, 1949, their war department. Things changed with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and the outbreak of war. Harvard Crimson interviewed Tsurumi and two other Japanese students and reported Shunsuke to be somewhat philosophical about events. Two other students, Masahiro Nishibori, a 23-year-old graduate student attached to the Japanese embassy in Washington, so he eventually joined uh, Shinsuke to uh, the boat to going back to Japan in 1942. And George Fujimoto, an uh, American citizen of Japanese descent, he said, he doesn't see how the situation can affect me at all. I am an American like, like the rest of us involved in a war. But it turns out his family uh, was quite uh, family was sent to the internment camp and all his, uh, all his family's belongings are taken and, uh, and he had hard time finding graduate school, he accepted him. At the end, he was uh, accepted in the University of Michigan and continued his graduate studies. Shinsuke was arrested by FBI self-identifying as an anarchist in March, 1942. So he wrote his honor thesis in the prison in, Japan, in Boston and Harvard granted him uh, BA in May, 1941. So 
In June 1942, uh, Shinsuke departed to, for Japan in uh, Japan uh, as a prisoner exchange. And you see that those two boats, the top boat uh, departed from New York City and they met, uh, they had middle part where uh, exchange prisoners from uh, Allied uh, or American uh, 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 living in Japan and East Asia uh, came from the boat in the boat, uh, bottom called Asamama. So they exchanged the prisoner at the middle point in the Mozambique. A year after Japan's surrender, he found the Shiso, uh, Shi he founded the Shiso no Kagaku, the Science of Thought magazine, with young intellectuals in including his sister Katsuko, historian Kiyoko Takeda, and political theorist uh, Maruyama, Ma Masao Maruyama. He published numerous books, and that including uh, uh, an intellectual history of wartime Japan, 1931 through 45, and a cultural history of post-war Japan, 1945 through 1980. These are translated in English. Here, I just want to share this, this interview of him uh, done by American broadcaster. Hopefully. This is Professor Tsurumi, who voices his protest. The reason for the, mutual security, uh, the, the objection against the Mutual Security Act is quite simple, that is that it may endanger us, but the, uh, that is not the issue uh, since the 19th of May. Uh, since then, the issue is that uh, uh, the democratic procedures are violated, so that uh, uh, for the reason of simple democracy, we want the present premier go and uh, the present parliament dissolved. We so uh, this is his voice. So, oops. This During the Vietnam War, uh, Tsurumi uh, Shinsuke started the Beheiren, a uh, citizen coalition for peace in Vietnam. Uh, this is a movement, and uh, he he protested the US war effort in Southeast Asia and to assist uh, American military deserters. In recent years, uh, he publicly uh, pro protested the US led war in Afghanistan and Iraq and the overseas dis dispatch of Jap Japan's self defense forces. Uh, in 1948 through 70, he taught three institutions, Kyoto University, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and Doshisha University. Shinsuke died on July 20th, 2015 of pneumonia in Kyoto, Japan. Thank you very much. Kuniko, Annie, Ross, thank you so much for uh, this fabulous presentation. I know it's hard to keep everything in a sm short amount of time with so much like information. We do have two questions I want to get in there. So we'll do a quick Q&A uh, session um, and then we'll have Emily come back in for some brief remarks. But our first question um, I'd like to throw out there and this is to you, Ross. Uh, one of our pre-submitted questions uh, essentially ask, are there any anthologies or collections of indigenous experiences at Harvard you can recommend, uh, recommend to access more of this history? A really good question. I don't know of any anthologies or collections like what I think the person asking is imagining, but I will recommend a couple things to take a look at. And if I can put a few links in the chat, you can follow up on them. One is that people should look at the Henry Milner write out a book about William Jones, which is what I drew a lot on for this talk. And really, although it's written by a uh, write out about Jones after Jones's death, really relays a lot of information about 
Jones, at least in his experience at Harvard, which is again, really fascinating. The second recommendation is a book called Our Beloved Ken by Lisa Brooks that I would recommend. It's a sort of rethinking and re uh, interpretation of King Philip's War in the 17th century. I'll link it here as well. Um, before Lisa's work, really, the, what we knew about the 17th century in the Indian College came to us from historians like, um, um, now I'm blanking on his name, the, there's a famous uh, historian of Harvard, um, Morrison, Samuel Eliot Morrison. And you know, that's a very particular perspective on it. Lisa really complicates the story about the Indian College, about Caleb Chishateamuk, what it means to come to Harvard as a Wampanoag man, what it means um, for to come as a Nipmuc man in Massachusetts. So really interesting work there. And finally, what I would recommend for that kind of Native experience modern and how to get at that is to take a look at some of these links provided by HUNAP halfway down this page about student and alumni organizations. This is where you see uh, students, Native students now reflecting on their experience at Harvard. And that's really important too. And they're not captured in you know, published biographies by their peers necessarily, but lots of blog posts, YouTube videos, and kind of write-ups about what it means to be native at Harvard in the 21st century that you can access through these organizations, which I find um, equally as important to take a look at. So I'll stop there. Awesome, thank you, Ross. Um, our next question comes from Lynn uh, Menduana. Lynn, if you wanna uh, unmute yourself and show up on our screen, you can ask the question. Uh, it, I believe it's going to be for Annie, so. Oh, yes, I would like to know more about the Boxer Indemnity Scholarships. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um, the history of the Boxer um, Indemnity Fund Scholarship is uh, quite a complex. Briefly, um, the program established uh, um, a scholarship and funded uh, a lot of Chinese students to study um, in United States uh, starting 1909. Um, also, the, uh, the fund first started the Tsinghua University. Um, Tsinghua became the preparation school uh, for the students uh, to pre prepare for the American college. Uh, uh, they, uh, uh, the first three groups of the um, indemnity fund scholarship students, actually they, uh, they just passed the examination, which is like a seven to eight days long examination. Uh, they did not do um, many preparation at Tsinghua. Uh, after the first three batches, uh, later on, the students stayed in Tsinghua for a couple of years of, uh, to prepare for school uh, in the U.S. Uh, one of, uh, um, one of uh, the Harvard graduates, uh, like Zhu Kezheng and Ye Qi Sun, uh, who uh, earned his PhD here and uh, um, left uh, for back to China, who started um, Tsinghua's physics department. And uh, many, among many of his students, um, uh, he recommended to send later to um, study at US schools. Uh, two of them uh, uh, granted a Nobel Prize in physics. So the history uh, for the fund is quite a comp complex. So there's uh, many, you can search many over the website. So lots of information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie and everyone. Uh, Emily, I'm gonna have you come on back and close out our program. Thank you so much everyone for attending today. On behalf of the Unity SIGs and HAA, thank you again for joining us and exploring these powerful Harvard student stories. Uh, and thank you to so many of you for, for sticking around with us as we ran over a little bit, but we can see that there's just so many more stories to tell and so many more details to every one of these stories. We are grateful to our speakers for their ongoing research and for their efforts to facilitate access to the powerful knowledge preserved in their collections. 
In my land acknowledgement, I spoke of the importance of standing against our erasure. In two days on May 5th, I invite you to resist another dire form of erasure by joining me and observing a day of awareness for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls by wearing red, posting a photo about why you're wearing red, if you're social media inclined, and learning more about this movement. And so you can just search MMIWG, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and you'll learn a lot more. Any such solidarity would be a great lead in to our fifth and final pre-Unity Weekend webinar. Next up in 10 days from now on Thursday, May 13th, please join us for Believe Us, Misogyny, Racism, and Intersectional Vulnerabilities of Women of Color, in which we will explore the connective history and unique vulnerabilities of women of color living at the intersection of racism and sexism. You can also check out uh, our Unity Past webinars. I usually just search Harvard Unity webinars, but it's alumni.harvard.edu slash unity dash webinars. So there you can find the two recent Harvard Alumni Allyship Series webinars, which were excellent, and I definitely recommend them. And you can also find the Harvard Archives Presents webinar from November that was referenced earlier. Thank you again, and have a great day.